You are listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from IIED. Access to electricity in the poorest countries has begun to accelerate, and renewable energy is making gains in the electricity sector. Despite this progress, around a billion people remain without access to electricity, while some three billion are without access to clean cooking fuels and technologies. Off-grid and mini-grid solutions can be designed to provide affordable electricity to poor communities in hard-to-reach areas, but governments hoping to harness these technologies to achieve universal access to energy by 2030 need to find new ways to attract more finance. To discuss these and other related issues, in this podcast, our Director of Communications, Liz Carlisle, talks with three expert colleagues from our energy team. Hi. And welcome to IIED's podcast, Make Change Happen. I'm your host today, and my name's Liz Carlisle, and I'm Director of the Communications Group here at IIED. We're really excited to have this new podcast underway. We've done one episode. Um, Any listeners out there who've heard that episode, thank you for taking the time to listen, and we'd very much welcome feedback. But today, let me welcome my colleagues from IIED who are in the energy team. So I'm joined today by Ben Garside, who is the principal researcher and energy team lead here at IIED. Welcome, Ben. And I know that you've worked for a number of years in international development. uh, But I think before that, uh, it's good for listeners to know that you do have a kind of engineering background and you've worked in telecoms and ICTs. So you have that very nice mix between technical experience and latterly a big focus on kind of people-centred approaches to development. Thanks, Liz. I'm also joined by Nipunika Pereira. Welcome, Nipunika. You're a researcher here at IID in the energy team. And my understanding is that you were an engineer, Mm -hmm. you qualified as an engineer, Mm -hmm. and that you have previously been an energy consultant and also worked a practical action. So you've looked very particularly at energy access and links between gender Mm -hmm. and also with climate resilience and adaptation. Mm -hmm. That's right, And last but definitely not least, Kevin Johnstone, who's also a researcher here at IIED. And looking at your bio, Kevin, you talk about yourself as a kind of energy access specialist. That's right. And I understand you've been looking particularly in fragile and transitional economies and really understanding the relationship between sort of grids, mini grids, home systems and kind of finance and delivery models. Correct. All sounds pretty technical, but I know you're (laughs) going to make it really interesting. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Um, So let's kick off. Ben, why is energy important? Actually, energy, uh, for a lot of people, I, I have people approaching me saying, is energy really important given... Uh, all of the other priorities if you're looking at, for example, communities in Africa. And, I mean, first of all, at a global level, there has been uh, a new recognition. So we have the Sustainable Development Goals now. Energy wasn't recognised in the previous Millennium Development Goals, but we see now the Sustainable Development Goal 7 um, is is an energy uh, goal which, which has three different components, and one of them is around energy access which is the predominant focus that we have here at IIED. And I think there's also increasing recognition within the SDG system that energy is an enabler for a lot of the other goals. But then equally, when you go down to the community level and ask people, what are your priorities? Often energy doesn't come up as the top or even in the top three, four, five. And then you say to them, well, you're holding a phone in your hand. Where did the power come from that? So there's, there's a more in-depth conversation, a more informed conversation, um, that when that takes place at, at the community level, people um, really identify then with uh, energy within health, within education, within uh, livelihoods, jobs and income, and, and how there is potential there to, to improve lives.
So energy is obviously a critical issue, but I guess also energy means different things to different people. I mean, energy is quite a, a generic term. Uh, it's often used interchangeably with electricity, but it's not the same. Of course, energy can be for transport, for where we have more increasingly we have electric transport, but a lot of it isn't. We have energy for cooking. Um, and actually, when you look at the statistics out there, there are three billion people without access to uh, modern cooking uh, services and one billion without access to electricity. So we really have to be quite specific about what we mean and more importantly, what the energy is to be used for to, to make changes. Well, we can, we can think about it another way. I guess when we look at these big global statistics, um, they're big numbers that are thrown out, but they, they mean different things. And my understanding is for that one billion, it's that um, these are people who don't easily get access to the big grid system. And for many people, energy means connection to a big grid. Kevin, you know about access. How does that sit with this one billion? Yeah, so I think with, with the one billion, uh, a large portion of those people don't have access, uh, for example, to the grid and in fact live far from uh, grid areas. Usually the grid, as we call it, is kind of more in urban um, areas. It's more centralized. Um, it's more expensive in a lot of ways. Um, but kind of with energy and if you're talking specifically about electricity, we have this kind of spectrum of, of access. Um, so we measure it uh, through different tiers of access, as we call it. So uh, tier one is, is very uh, low powered, probably a solar lantern, for example. Mm -hmm. And we go up through steps all the way up to what they call tier five, um, which is kind of the, the grid quality 24-7 uh, uh, electricity access. Um, and usually um, we, we kind of call the technologies that are kind of tier one, tier two, and up to even tier three um, kind of off-grid technologies, whereas the, the main grid, as I mentioned, is, is kind of in urban settings. These off-grid um, technologies can reach people away from the grid. And uh, they also provide different levels of service from basic lighting, phone charging, uh, all the way up to kind of what they call mini-grid systems, which connects entire villages and provide more substantial um, power generation for um, income, for livelihoods. Nipunika, have you any thoughts for you? What, what would this, this connect, connectivity, the potential to be connected? Yeah, from the experience I've had, particularly uh, having done work in uh, countries like Nepal, uh, is, is that a lot of the people who are not connected, who are left left behind, for instance, are those who live in the most remote areas or, or those who are sort of the poorest communities who live uh, under the grid, like where the grid goes over them. Mm. And um, look, connecting both what Kevin and Ben has been discussing, um, connectivity doesn't necessarily always translate into impacts. There's a lot of different things that needs to happen to maximize the impact of connection that people have. So particularly, I've just returned from Nepal and I've been discussing with um, quite a few people who work on providing energy services on a daily basis to these rural communities. And a lot of the challenges they face is around ensuring that people are actually using energy to for something impactful, for something that they can actually benefit from. So, for instance, understanding where should the lighting go in, in the house? Is mm -hmm. it in the kitchen where the cooking happens or is it in an area where uh, they play card games? Or how do you really ensure that people are benefiting from that and also maximizing that impact? So, uh, particularly different types of models that are used to deliver energy services needs to start considering these uh, social cultural aspects and um, we've been engaging very closely with uh, the health sector and, and a specific nurse we've been talking to called Jefferson who's working in a dispensary in, in, in a rural health centre. According to him uh, it, often health facilities are built without considering the, the reality of the energy needs for them to deliver energy services, uh, health services so, for instance, uh, when it comes to providing maternity health services, vaccinations, uh, clinics, 
uh, or even uh, specific testing for uh, blood testing or uh, other testing facilities that they're meant to do as a rural health clinic, they struggle to deliver it because energy is not often thought through uh, at the very start of it. Um, so there's uh, a lot of different things that needs to come together to actually maximize impacts from energy. So it sounds really complex. So we've got the complexity of people needing to connect in different ways and then from different places. And then we've got the complexity of trying to understand very particular needs and the kind of capacity mm-hmm. to make the most of that energy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the need to integrate the way you do the planning I mean, Punika's just talked about health. Of course, you have education. You have various different sectors where energy uh, has a strong potential to be improving the, the way that the services are being delivered work. Um, and that's not even to begin to talk about livelihoods, uh, agriculture, livestock, a lot of the potential there where energy can, can enable. So what we've been finding and, and sort of getting practical... Um, within Kenya, we've been doing some work with uh, CAFOD and Caritas Katui in partnership with the Kenyan government. And what we're doing there is mapping out these needs at the community level. So not just asking people, what are your needs? Having a more informed process. It takes a little bit more time. You spend a bit more time on planning. But the idea is, as Nipunika was saying, you, you try to get deeper inside the, the gaps there to do with energy, the gaps there to do with non-energy, so that the solutions really have impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and doing that in a way that can scale as well. It's, of course, doing an in-depth uh, process in every single village can be time-consuming. So the question is, how do you bring out some of those needs and benefit from economies of scale so that you can cluster them together? So it also seems interesting to me, that's also about getting people out of their kind of sector boxes and talking together. Yes, very challenging within government, I have to say. Absolutely. But of course, from the community perspective, what's a sector and why is that relevant to them? Mm -hmm. So I assume you're bringing different stakeholders into the conversation wherever you can. Yes. And and I know that that's something we we think dealing with difficult challenges today is going to be more and more important that change can only take place where we have different stakeholders yes. thinking about need thinking yes. about uh, the relationship between their service and how mm-hmm. something is used and, and i'm an engineer um so you know of course there's a little bit of a bias there from the from the history side um <laughs> but there's a real need to you look at uh, energy sector planning and often it is the engineers, and they are thinking, as, as Kevin was talking about earlier, about the rollout of the big grid, how many megawatts or gigawatts can be generated for that grid. Important things, um, but it's not really bringing in the, the end needs and the planning across from energy into the other sectors that needs to go in part and parcel with that if you're going to really deliver the impacts. So one of the things that, um, when I've heard you speak before, Ben, that I find really interesting is this point about sort of productive uses of energy. So, you know, I'm imagining that, you know, when you're thinking about planning and you're thinking about who's using what, you're thinking about different kinds of use. So can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, actually, Kevin's been leading that work within within the Tanzania Energy Change Lab programme that we have. So maybe he can talk a little bit about the activities we've been doing on the ground. Sure. So in the Energy Change Lab programme, which is a programme we run with our partner Hivos, we look at a number of different uh, energy streams. But in particular, I've been working on the Productive Uses of Energy uh, work stream, which is looking at how electricity uh, as an input can be used to increase uh, productivity uh, and income in remote communities. Uh, So basically increasing economic activity in these communities, which also helps uh, pay for the electricity itself. So we've been working with 
uh, two different mini grid uh, developers in Tanzania, implementing what we call prototypes um, and experimenting around some of the challenges that uh, mini grid developers are facing. So, what we've seen uh, and learned is that the uh, mini grid infrastructure, once installed, doesn't kind of uh, generate demand on its own. There's a lot of supporting activities that need to be applied in communities to help stimulate demand for these electricity services so that they can pay for themselves. So but like that point I think that you made, Ben, the other day where you put a pole in and you're considered connected even if you're sort of 80 metres away. Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, and that talks about kind of government definitions of what makes access And a lot of the discussions around the pole issue is usually around grid extensions. So there's also all these issues around getting access to that pole, for example. So a lot of the work in the Energy Change Lab uh, program, uh, we've been looking at prototyping ideas and experimenting around some of these issues of how to get um, access to that pole. Um, So we've been working with two mini-grid developers in uh, Tanzania to look at the kind of a more holistic approach in terms of stimulating demand. So if we have an entrepreneur, for example, who wants to buy a milling machine, um, that entrepreneur needs access to finance and whether the finance is uh, a savings um, uh, of his own or her own, uh, or it's uh, access to um, some kind of microfinance that appliance needs to be uh, or equipment needs to be financed. Then we have the technical skills to actually run that appliance. So uh, the entrepreneur needs to understand how the appliance uh, works, how it operates, how to maintain it uh, efficiently, um, these kinds of uh, skills. Then there's the skills around operating a business itself in terms of keeping books, the accounting, and all of these kind of business operations skills that need to be in place. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the access to appliances themselves. So in a lot of um, these kind of remote communities, there, there are some appliances, but they're quite old, very inefficient if they're available. Um, and this also kind of links to the issue around market access, supply chains, bringing appliances hundreds of kilometers from usually the capital uh, into these remote communities over uh, very difficult terrain, usually not paved roads, and then how do you get technicians to service uh, these uh, kinds of equipment? The technology is is quite proven in the field; it, it works very well. Um, but there's there's a lot of ideas um, on the mini grid itself not being able to run some machinery, which can be true for a lot of the smaller mini grids, which can be an issue in terms of if you're promoting productive uses of energy. So there's the question of whether or not these smaller grids are actually a viable uh, business model to to be uh, pursued. Then you have questions around the tariff. Many of these mini grids uh, have much higher tariffs uh, due to the technology. They don't have the the scale that uh, a large grid has as well. And many, uh, in fact, most uh, of of the grids around the world are are quite subsidized as as a public service. So Many of these mini-grids are uh, private developers, so uh, not necessarily subsidized through government schemes. So you have a lot of uh, customers who will see, you know, my aunt in uh, in the capital city, their tariff is is quite low and I'm paying, you know, two, three, four, five times uh, uh, more than they are. So there's issues around these kinds of perceptions of uh, equality Uh, in terms of uh, the technology. I mean, I really like the sound of the uh, Energy Change Lab. Can you tell people a little bit about how that works? I think it's a really nice way of bringing different people together. It's quite a dynamic, um, and when we say lab, it's not uh, a technical lab. It's a social innovation lab. So we do work with technical partners like mm-hmm. the, like the mini grid companies. But at, at a sort of national level, we have a dialogue platform. And the purpose of that is to be bringing, uh, it's a demand driven around key issues within the sector. So this sort of so-called productive uses of energy for income, that's, that's one, of the, one of the main 
uh, themes within the lab. And we bring together people from inside the sector and outside the sector. So again, it's that sort of cross-sector uh, building of understanding. But to avoid it just being a talk shop, we have these ground level prototypes. So what can we learn quickly? How can we work with communities to understand some of the issues Kevin was talking about? And it's, and it's not just uh, building the demand for the productive uses, it's, it's helping manage the demand. So for example, you don't want a very small village to, to have uh, 20 barber shops when one you know, entrepreneur sees another one, there's a mm. tends to be a copycat culture. So how do you engage with the community to manage that? How do you understand some of those social issues or culturally embedded issues? And it can be just contextual from seeing other things. Kevin mentioned that people think mini grids are inferior. Even household solar panels, so just a panel on the roof with batteries um, providing lighting. There are some good systems out there. There are a lot, a lot of bad systems out there informal products coming in from China uh, and so people have the perception that solar doesn't really work so you're actually starting from beneath a level playing field so how do you gather all those lessons and that's what we're doing with the lab through these prototyping processes and bring them up to a dialogue platform making sure that those voices and the experience from the ground are really embedded so that you can change the way that the design of systems work and, and the way that policy and regulation happen Nipunika, have you anything to add on this? Have you seen similar approaches in Nepal? You were talking about the trip you've just come back from. Yeah, I think one of the main things I was wanting to add to the discussion was around um, the importance of understanding the different end users as well. And often, for instance, often men and women think differently. Mm -hmm. So their needs could be quite different as well. Uh, uh, the, looking at the same example of where do you need the lighting, the woman might want it in a different place mm -hmm. to a man. So how do you understand those dynamics and actually make sure that it's leading to the impact that they're expecting at the household? So managing expectations is quite important when you're engaging with communities to provide energy services. And in the PUE example, we also work with female entrepreneurs because sometimes the needs for... Uh, training needs um, uh, might be slightly different or maybe more mentoring is needed uh, and, and there might be social c barriers that actually prevent women from engaging more at the entrepreneur level. So this is also again something that the Energy Change Lab has been uh, looking at. Lots of r things are happening, lots of things have been piloted also in Nepal. Again, uh, some of the work we are trying to do now is to sort of understand all these dynamics and so try to fit into the changing aspects in these countries we're working in. So um, countries like Nepal are going through massive changes in terms of their policies and their uh, governance structures. Um, so we are sort of trying to see how can learnings from the ground actually can, can influence the decision making happening at the moment. So I'm also thinking about this question that three billion people still don't have access to clean, safe cooking. That's right, yeah. It's still quite an astonishing mm. statistic. Um, and I guess that has huge energy implications, presumably huge gender implications. W what have we got to do to understand how energy or how the right kind of affordable clean energy if you're thinking about SDG 7 mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do we get that in the kind of cooking space so in terms of a climate perspective um, we have issues around what fuels are being used mm -hmm. uh, the uh, infrastructure that's being developed around those fuels so if you're talking about um, gas for example you have to invest a large amount in the infrastructure around getting that gas into the various communities into urban centers etc um, but you also, for example, wood uh, can be a huge um, you know, element to deforestation. So as we've seen in Tanzania, this is affecting communities um, that are dependent on wood, for example. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean wood is bad because there's also you know, sustainably harvested wood, which you know, takes a lot of uh, investment as well, a lot of resources mm -hmm. and time. Um, and these kinds of issues. You've got um, briquettes made from agricultural waste, which um, can, can help um, you know, farmers with uh, building extra value from their harvest. Um, 
but, uh, you know, feeding into kind of the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, forests are, are large, uh, you know, carbon sinks, and a lot of them are being cut down for wood, uh, for timber, for um, fuel, um, all these other kind of cross-cutting issues. I think cooking has, has been a, a very tough nut to crack, and there does tend to be, for a variety of reasons, in, in including sort of this big sector focus that we mentioned earlier, more of a focus on electricity when, as you say, there's three billion rather than one billion in, in the cooking space. I mean, at the local level, you really have to be understanding the way people cook and how they cook and who makes the decisions at the household level. We know generally men have more power uh, on those decisions, particularly around spending. Um, but then there's also sort of general... Uh, cultural attitudes. If you live in a r rural area and you gather firewood, your perception is that firewood is a right. It's free. So getting people to then be willing to pay for a cooking service, even if it's subsidised, is, is quite challenging. Um, so th there's a lot of sort of behaviour understanding mm -hmm. that really needs to go on there. And I think within the cooking sector there's been quite a lot of focus on the technical or the technology side what we need to do is deploy for example gas um, and there have been good success stories on that um, but without really thinking about even if you do have gas even if you're willing to pay for gas you might be actually using the gas because uh, it helps speed up your cooking so your priority is speed efficiency rather than health now, one of the main reasons that money is going into that sector is, is from a health perspective mm -hmm. and women and children breathing in uh, fumes. But what you'll see often when you go, and we've been to many, many um, uh, small houses where, where people are, are cooking day to day, you'll see that the, the wood traditional three-stone fire is being used right next to the more modern appliance. You get, you get both to different preferences for different tastes, um, more speed, more efficiency. So really getting behind those things in terms of really understanding so that the solution is, is, is then designed in a more holistic way. So big challenges. Um, I was reading that um, of all the kind of, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the kind of global energy funding, about is it 98.7% goes to the grid and something like 1.3% to off-grid. And I'm assuming that both in terms of the kind of productive uses of energy and energy for cooking, and this one billion that is not con that of people who aren't connected... I mean, I'm assuming that this kind of off-grid funding is critical, and that's perhaps what you were talking about in terms of the kind of finance models. So if we wanted to really make a big change here, what is it that's got to happen? So I think there's a number of different finance models that will work for different contexts. And maybe step one is looking at what has worked and what has not worked well in these different contexts, identifying those characteristics, and then uh, using those lessons and applying them to other places. So to take a step back and look at the large picture, if we're aiming for universal access, everyone has uh, at least tier one you know, basic lighting access by 2030. The research shows that we need over $50 billion a year, which includes grid and off-grid. But if you're looking purely at off-grid, we'll need about $20 billion or so per year. And uh, currently, we're, we're nowhere near that uh, in, in any way. It's, it's a couple hundred million per year. And in fact, corporate-level uh, investments, uh, in, especially into some of these solar home system kind of lighting, phone charging systems, has uh, risen to two billion, but it's taken ten years to reach there. So we still have a really long uh, way to go. But a promising path forward in terms of bringing in more money into the sector. So to to fill this huge billions and billions, uh, you know, financing gap, uh, in order to reach by 2030 for SDG seven, one promising method is through blended finance. 
So that's kind of using public money um, to try and kind of uh, attract more private uh, investor money through what they call structured funds that have different levels of risk for different levels of investors' uh, appetite for risk. So one promising way of doing that, SunFunder, uh, which is a financial intermediary, has written a paper that said basically they've been able to use uh, grant money to uh, multiply uh, their investments by 11 uh, into their funds. So blended finance is, is, has, a, has a promising future for off-grid access. There's also the idea that more public money needs to go into off-grid. So a lot of off-grid, uh, on-grid sorry, systems are subsidized. So there's much discussion around um, subsidizing off-grid technologies. And especially in terms of what some people call smart subsidies or, or maybe targeted subsidies, especially for, pe- for remote communities that may not be able to uh, afford or cannot uh, have the, the support services needed to support, you know, as we're talking about productive uses of energy, um, in order to reach um, these people, there, there needs to be some kind of uh, targeted subsidy, which requires probably uh, uh, alignment with government uh, policy. And, and in, in that light, we also have to look at coordinating uh, planning between uh, grid and off-grid, so the grid uh, in many countries will not be extended in time. It's too costly. So if we can get better planning between either uh, public kind of sponsored mini grids, private uh, mini grids, uh, whatever it will take in the different contexts, there needs to be better coordination and planning in order to ensure that the money is used uh, effectively uh, and efficiently. We've we've just done a big piece of research on this called Moving More Money, but the, this sort of aggregation idea. So as Kevin was saying, it's important to have more money, mm-hmm. um, but it's also, I mean, to be fair, you can see why it's easier for money to go into the large-scale infrastructure. It's one big transaction. Um, you have yeah. big power stations yeah. built. With the, with the off-grid, you have many, many millions of, of different uh, small-scale energy uh, initiatives that need need to be started up to, in order to 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 solve this one billion people gap. Um, Back to this challenge that we think about a lot in IAD, which is how to get money to where it matters. Absolutely. Most. And and it's not only the money with well, these aggregators and what we've been finding. They they each of the ones we looked at is working in a different way, but the aggregation of things like a capacity building, technical assistance. Um, information sharing, mm-hmm. uh, even logistics, these types of things matter as well. And, and that sort of uh, economy of scale you can get across aggregation uh, for those types of functions has, has really helped. But a lot, lot more needs to be done, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the funding, but also the way that the, the policy instruments work together with the finance to help get that uh, the, the, the money down um, and the right sort of uh, implementation models we call energy delivery models uh, the planning around that that I was talking about earlier so that we can really see impacts on some of the poorest people Two things I think have come out of today's conversation and this is the importance of planning mm-hmm. really trying to understand what it is people need energy for and making sure the right conversations happen, the right capacity and the right understanding of need drives that. Then I think I'm hearing this question of finance. Not only is there not enough yet in the right places, but there is a deal of complexity in understanding the different kind of models and mechanisms that we can use to do that. Thank you for that. Um, I wondered if we could finish with perhaps a comment on thinking... Um, I sort of threatened you with a change question earlier, but I'm (laughs) I'm also thinking that people might like to be thinking about energy in relation to climate change. You know, we know that we have got to support climate change. We know that um, energy is, I suppose, global greenhouse gas emissions, isn't it about, it's kind of over 60% is energy. Uh, So we need to build up renewables, and we're only at around, is it 17%, I think? Um, so where, where in your thinking, in, in your energy discussions, how, how does this sit and align with the climate emergency? 
a lot of the uh, off-grid technologies that sort of been pushed are renewable focused. Mm-hmm. So the in order to reach the one billion uh, who currently don't have access to electricity, grid extensions are happening, and and but but yet you need more resilient systems to reach those communities who are out of reach. And in most of the countries, they are in very remote areas. There's a lot of issues around uh, access. I think from a mitigate, climate mitigation perspective, uh, off-grid technologies really contribute to these countries who need to now bridge this gap of energy access uh, by pushing for more and more renewables, mm-hmm. and off-grid is, is, is a main part of it. And in terms of climate adaptation, where uh, communities are very poor, rural communities are currently facing climate issues because of droughts and and, and other uh, issues. So there is the opportunity for using off-grid renewable energy technologies and it needs to be looked at more to see how it really contributes to climate change adaptation and building resilience of these communities. Uh, But from a mitigation perspective, again, you have countries where uh, like Bangladesh, where the emissions are significantly low compared to countries, uh, more developed countries, uh, but there is a huge community still wanting access or still left mm-hmm. behind without access. There's a huge uh, need for actually promoting more renewable mm-hmm. uh, energy systems, and um, and there is a lot going on. For in- instance, through uh, programs that's done by uh, IDCOL, who is the Infrastructure Development Company Limited in in Bangladesh. Uh, who's promoting solar mini grids and, and some of these mini grids are also mm-hmm. used to uh, fueling electric vehicles, electric um, uh, taxis and all that. So yes, yeah, so there's there's a huge potential and, and it's something that countries have started thinking through. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's any experience from Africa you want to add. Well, I, I just to add, I mean, I think, as you're saying, the, the important thing really is some level of inclusion. So mm-hmm. at the local level, we have to think about how people get access. A lot of that is is already starting to be delivered through renewable energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we need to build in that resilience component so that we're planning. And those sort of local planning uh, tools that we mentioned that, that we've been working on, that, that helps because if you're thinking about solutions more holistically, mm-hmm. you have to be thinking about what's happening with the climate whilst we're planning our water pump for, exactly. for, mm-hmm. for that solution. But then if you go back to the... The big infrastructure and the main grid, and that's the biggest opportunity for for mitigation of of, uh, of climate emissions. There's a lot of um, pressure out there, and there needs to be more and increasing pressure on the divest invest agenda. Mm-hmm. So really putting pressure on for 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 UK government, for mm-hmm. uh, the African mm-hmm. Development Bank, the World Bank, to be not investing in coal, to be not investing. Uh, unless there's sort of good reason in some of the sort of still carbon emitting, but so-called less carbon emitting. So there's there's a lot of that, but then we need to be ensuring that it's happening within, if we're talking about green economies, that it's inclusive green economies. So we're not we're not just saying that the the, 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 the greening should happen without the the access and the impacts for some of the poorest, who of course generally didn't create the climate problem. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hearing, though, which is good news, is that the approaches, the things we're thinking about, the ways in which we're thinking about this, very closely aligned to the way we need to respond to climate challenges. And that by doing that um, in a holistic way, we've got an opportunity to build benefits all round. Well, I think I'm going to say thank you to you all for a really interesting conversation. I hope our listeners have enjoyed it. I certainly have. And I think actually what it's made me realise, um, particularly from the kind of productive uses of energy and the whole the cooking dimension, is that I personally need to go home and understand a lot better about sort of where my energy needs are. What am I contributing or what am I overusing or how am I, how am I going to respond to this? And I realise that I, I just make assumptions because I turn on a light but I need to understand this a lot better and I've really enjoyed our discussion. Find out more about Neponika, Ben and Kevin's work and the issues discussed today. Visit www.ied.org energy. 
You will also find recent briefings and papers on our publications library website at pubs.iied.org slash energy. You have been listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. The podcast is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit our website at www.iied.org.